if you don't understand this, then you end up blaming yourself. You end up telling yourself the story of, well, I just must not be good enough. I must not be talented enough. I guess I wasn't working hard enough. But none of those things are probably true. What is probably the actual story of your career is you were. And these massive systemic things have kept you out or kept you from getting to where you should be. You're listening to The Other 50%, A History of Hollywood. I'm Julie Harris-Walker. This is the podcast where I talk to successful women in entertainment and hear their stories. For this episode, I got to catch up with Naomi McDougall-Jones. You will remember her from a couple of years ago when she was coming off of her TED Talk about what it's like to be a woman in Hollywood. Well, since then, she has been on the Joyful Vampire Tour with her feature film, Bite Me, and has written a book, The Wrong Kind of Women, Inside Our Revolution to Dismantle the Gods of Hollywood. Oof. We had a lot to talk about. You can find us at theother50percent.com for added features, photos, show notes, and the merchandise. You can also listen on Apple Podcasts and all the podcast places. We did this talk during COVID over the internet. The audio is not great. Forgive us. Okay, here's my conversation with Naomi McDougall-Jones. Have a listen. So today we have a special treat. We have Naomi McDougall-Jones back on the show. Welcome Thank you so much for having me back again. Well, you have done so much since we last talked. I think the first time we talked, you were just, you had just done your TED Talk and you had, I think, made a movie and you were making another movie. But since then, I know you took your movie on tour. You're breaking the independent film model. You wrote a book. You're teaching online classes. Where do we even start? Should we start with your book or your movie? <laughs> let's, let's go chronologically through time so we can start with the movie. Okay. Go. It was Bite Me. Okay. It was called Bite Me. It was my second feature film that I wrote, acted, and then produced. And it's a subversive romantic comedy about a real life vampire and the IRS agent who audits her. Uh, <laughs> a real life vampire. <laughs> yes. So there is a real community of people in the real world who identify as vampires. Um, Wait, and, serious? Seriously? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yes. And this intersects with the tour because we met a lot of them. Um, yeah. So oh, okay. there's there's a community of people who uh, believe that they need to drink human blood to stay healthy. Are they serious? Yeah. Okay. How and, do how do they how do they get it? Um, they have donors. It's all very consensual and responsible. They don't attack anybody. <laughs> you will not be fed on by a vampire unless you want to be. Everybody gets blood tests all the time. It's very responsible. Yeah. But but that is so that so the main uh, the female character in the film who I play female lead is a vampire. And she okay. got audited, um, <laughs> as you do, because of, of the, anyway, that's a whole other thing, but she does and uh, ends up falling in love with her IRS agent, who is sort of a buttoned up normie guy who is actually a secret weirdo longing to get out. <laughs> <laughs> That is an amazing premise. <laughs> so I know you kind of set out to break the business model. Let's talk yeah. about what you did. Well, so I had made this first feature film, Imagine I'm Beautiful. And to, it came out in 2014. And we had made that film for $80,000. And we didn't know anything at that time, really. And it had done incredibly well, particularly given that we didn't know any, anything. And it had won a bunch of awards at film festivals and it got a distribution deal. And it actually even got a theatrical distribution deal, which for a film of that size with no name actors, is, we felt like Cinderella, like we had won the lottery. Amazing. And then, and the experience of that distribution felt good. But then when the numbers came back, <laughs> uh, so that film came out in 2014. And from the distribution company, we have to date received slightly less than $5,000 back. So you did everything right. We did everything right. We did everything right and won the lottery. And won the lottery and made $5,000 and made maybe. Slightly under $5,000. Okay, something's wrong with that picture. Yeah. So so of course like everybody at the beginning I was like, well maybe we just really messed up. Maybe we uh, you know, like whatever. And and because people don't talk about these things and there's so little transparency around just film distribution in general and bet- and even between filmmakers, right? Like everybody's afraid to sort of pull their pants down and show their numbers because, well, I think I've come to feel that it's probably because they're all so terrible that, pe- that but everybody is in isolation thinking that they, they've been duped and they are an idiot and they shouldn't say anything because if they do, they will look bad or stupid. Um, right, like you made some kind of mistake rather than there's a serious systemic mm, problem. Exactly. But I, I, my producing partner, Sarah Wharton on Bite Me, 
had she had also made a number of feature films before and had had very similar situations where she'd gotten a distribution deal and then not really made any money. And so we started looking at each other we're like, maybe this is actually just what happens. So we, we did a little digging around and became pretty convinced that this was the case, that like all of <laughs> basically all of indie film distribution is this magical system where you put movies in one end and the distributors make money and the aggregators make money and the sales agents make money and the platforms make money and nothing comes out the other end for the film, for the filmmakers yeah. or their investors. So we were like, well, that... <laughs> That's not sustainable. It's not really as a sustainable. Career. It seems it seems insane to continue putting our films into a system with those results. So yeah. we're like, well, well, actually, what happened is I had a dream. Actually, with that, oh. we were in an RV driving around the U.S. with our film and and on something called the Joyful Vampire Tour of America. And I called Sarah in the morning and I was like, so maybe this is crazy, but what if we rented an RV and, and went on the Joyful Vampire Tour of America? And because she's the greatest producing partner ever, she's like, yes, and let's put fangs on the RV. Oh my God, that's amazing. <laughs> so that's what we did. I mean, we, we, we spent about four months researching this idea because so our basic premise here was that the way that independent film distribution works right now is that there are too many middle men um, and they are mm -hmm. men and there's so little profit coming into indie film right now that the middlemen just take it all and then it's gone and then there's no money out the other end. So we're like, we have to, what if we just took the film directly to the audiences that we know are there and people keep complaining that nobody wants to see films in theaters you know, Martin Scorsese writes, writes an op-ed about this like every other month. But our theory was that actually people do want to see indie films or do want to see films in theaters, but and are actually desperate to be in community events together. But you have to give them some proposition that's better than like spend a hundred dollars to see this movie and have the same experience you could have at home. There has to be something yeah. else. So the theory was what if what if the audiences could meet the filmmaker after the movie? So I'd do a Q&A, which isn't really a big deal in New York or LA, because if you can find a screening without a filmmaker present, it's kind of a miracle. Um, <laughs> yeah, whatever. We do that all the time. Right, exactly. Not a big deal. But I can tell you now from experience that in Wichita or in Vicksburg, Mississippi, or in even Columbus, Ohio, that is a really big deal. Yeah. So if you met the filmmaker and then because of the nature of the film, which is very whimsical and fun and sweet and very much about sort of like letting your freak flag fly, we invited the audience to come in costume. It didn't have to be a vampire costume. The instructions were that you could come dressed however makes you feel most joyful um, mm. because we were on the Joyful Vampire Tour. And also we threw a Joyful Vampire Ball after every screening. So... What we were inviting them to was really a whole evening out where they could come in costume if they wanted. And like, and, and the, the balls were sort of like part community building event, part party, part sort of like self acceptance evening. Um, amazing. Yeah. It was a whole event, a whole evening. And, and in most places, you got all of that for basically the cost of a movie ticket. Wow. So that was the theory. It was like, if you offered that, people really would come out and they would love it. And yeah. so we ended up, so, and we did it all of our, all ourselves, uh, really Sarah Wharton and I and, a, and some interns. And we, we managed to schedule 51 screenings in 40 cities over 90 days. And we moved into an RV <laughs> and myself, my husband and a documentary filmmaker moved into an RV together. And we did, we drove 13,001 miles in 90 days and did 51 screenings and 51 Joyful Vampire Balls. Oh, my God. And how did it go? <clears throat> well, I can tell you that we made more money in ticket sales alone from our first week of screenings than we did from Imagine I'm Beautiful at all. Okay, so there's something to it. <laughs> there's something to it. And we were very, very right about people coming out. We sold out screenings across the country. We people, Some people drove 30 miles to come to a screening in costume. People came out in costume all over the place. It was, it was so beautiful and so exciting and so fun. And what I heard from people over and over and over again was how we as a country are dying of loneliness which is even more poignant right now. Um, but this was yeah, last summer, this yeah. was in the summer of 2019. And even then people were saying like, 
like because of technology, like we just are so pulled apart from each other and we're in our phones and we're not interacting. And, and so many people would come out to me at the end of the night and say, like, I had the first meaningful interaction here with a stranger I've had in months or in a year. Um, oh. it was so moving. So how did you do, cause I think you had to learn a whole nother job, which was <laughs> marketing and community building. Yeah. I imagine. Yeah. <laughs> how did you go about doing that? Um, well, we did a lot of surveying and sort of poll taking of our audience of, cause we'd built, we'd built a small, but fervent fan base for the film sort of through production and post-production. And so we sort of like, when we were deciding the cities we were going to, for instance, we, we, um, we sent out a thing that said, like, we're thinking of doing this. If we did, would you want us to come to your city or town? And if so, would you be the local host and help us market it to your community? And ah. we got like, I think, 72 requests within the first two weeks, which of course was more than we could physically do in the time we had. But so, but then we knew where our audience was, uh, which I yeah. think is the smartest way of learning marketing for something because I think we, otherwise you're just guessing basically. But if you ask them and then, and then we would ask those people, okay, well, what theater should we play in? Like, where, where was your people? What's, what's the cool place to yeah. go to? And then they would tell us. Um, and other than that, we were really, and then the local host did prove to be absolutely crucial in getting communities out because one thing we, we learned was that the way that different communities learn about events or decide to go to events is completely different from place to place. Like some places are literally, there's still one bulletin board in town <laughs> for all the events and you just have to put your thing on that bulletin board. Um, and obviously in bigger places, it's more complex than that, but it, but that kind of information we wouldn't have had without the local hosts. Yeah. So you couldn't, you can't just do Facebook ads and expect people to show up. Although I, ha I mean, no, but I do have to say that we did run Facebook ads for specific screenings that uh -huh. were shockingly effective, which was, pr which was very amazing to me because we were only in each place for one night, right? So you had to be available on the night that we were in your town and be willing to leave your house and put on pants or a costume or whatever based on a yeah. Facebook, which seemed so unlikely, but I, but that definitely wasn't our biggest driver of audience. So I, I'm just curious, your Facebook ad targeting, I'm trying to imagine. So you would say, when you're choosing the things, yeah, right, yeah. for the Facebook ad, was it indie film, your town, vampires? Like, what were the things? So we would definitely geolocate them to whatever the area that we were going to be screening in. But I feel quite proud of this, actually. So so we began early on testing Facebook ads targeted at different groups of people. So we, we, we because the film's a vampire film and a romantic comedy and also kind of about like the mega nerds of the world, which we, we mm -hmm. consider ourselves card carrying members, though those are kind of three different types of groups to market to. So what we did is we ran Facebook ad tests to all those different groups to see who would respond to the film the most. So we tested like, if you say you like vampire films, are you going to respond to this? If you say you like romantic comedies, are you going to respond to this? And then the third group we tested was, um, do you like people who state Harry Potter as one of their things they like or whatever? Because we figured that Harry, well, A, our leading man was in Harry Potter. He played Tom Riddle. But also oh, yeah. we figured that Harry Potter ended up being a pretty good cipher for our audience in the sense that if you liked Harry Potter enough to put it on your Facebook page as an adult, you probably <laughs> were like, chances are good. You were probably at least in the mega nerd universe um, and would probably <laughs> therefore I relate to our film. And that, that did work really well. So great. Now I'm dying to know, did you make your money back on the film with your tour? So we didn't make our money back. We made about about $56,000, which again is a lot more than we made through a distributor on my last film. Mm -hmm. But in a twist ending, we ended up getting a bunch of uh, six offers actually from distribution companies and sales agents after the tour was over because we had already done the work of identifying and demonstrating that there was an audience. And so right. suddenly we got way more interest in the film than we would have if we had just gone that path originally. So we ended up working with... Um, going with this great sales agent, Therese Linden Cohn, with Talk Global Media. And so she's now in the process of selling off other rights internationally and domestically for the film. So I, I think there's some possibility that we will recoup 
between the tour and that eventually. Yeah. Um, yeah. So then here's the question for your next film. Mm -hmm. Would you do that again? Oh, for sure. In a heartbeat. It, it was legitimately one of the highlights of my life. It was, it was, oh, was so it amazing. Fun. And, and has made me a better artist too, because to, to travel to all of those places all across the country and hear what directly from people, what they thought of the movie and what they responded to and what moved them and what didn't, we get so locked into our New York and LA bubbles. And yeah. it was really, really instructive and very meaningful to engage with people in the middle of the country yeah. about film. What were some of the most surprising things they told you? Um, I think our most surprising screening was Vicksburg, Mississippi, which is a town that you drive into and there are a lot of Confederate flags around. It is like the yeah. South. And I, none of us had ever been to Mississippi before at all. And we had only been there because this gem of a, a man, Daniel Boone, who owns a theater, <laughs> what's his name? Where's he? <laughs> who owns a theater in, uh, in Vicksburg, Mississippi, had found out what we were doing and actually reached out to us and was like, you have to come here. And dry, and I was like, I'd, have you seen the movie? <laughs> like, I don't know. If, and he was like, no, no, come, you have to come. And, you know, I remember driving into, like, we were in, in the RV and driving across the, the border into Mississippi. And I, I remember my pulse going up because I felt really, nervous about how this film was going to be responded to there. I mean, for one thing, it's a very feminist forward film. It's about yeah. outsiders. It's a, it's, um, you know, it's, it's a very diverse film. It's, I was, I just, you know, I was like, I, I don't know what the response here is going to be. And I feel, I felt right. a little nervous. Um, sure. And then we got there and Daniel Boone and his man, Jack had painted our poster on the side of their building to advertise this. What? Hand painted. And the entire 100% of that audience came in costume. And it was very full. And what I realized was that it was all of the weirdos of Vicksburg, Mississippi, and that to be a weirdo in some in New York or LA or some other places is like kind of a big deal, but not that big a deal. But in Vicksburg, Mississippi, it's a really big deal to be a weirdo and an outsider. And we created this night where like these people had a space <laughs> and could be together and feel okay. And um, after that screening, this older gentleman came up to me and he, 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 start, he said like just a few words and then began just sobbing. And I, I like hugged him and held him and he just sobbed and, and, like he just felt seen in a way that he wasn't used to feeling seen. And it was, it was, it was so amazing and, and moving and, and reminded me just the, like why we tell stories and the power that right. stories can have. That is the entire point. That's the entire point. And I, and that's the other thing about showing movies, not in New York or LA. And, and I will say if I, if, and when I do this again, which I hope I do, I'm going to spend way more time in smaller towns and maybe even, and smaller cities and maybe even skip some of the bigger cities because like we just get so kind of jaded in uh, with, with like events and content in New York and LA. Cause it's just so much of it. Like even the mm -hmm. most amazing event that you go to is like not that much better than Tuesday night, you know? Um, I was going to say, it's just a Wednesday. We're exhausted. Yeah. We complain about it. <laughs> but, but you can, the impact on people in other places that don't have that stuff all the time is, or at least the potential for impact is so much greater. Amazing. When can we see the documentary? Oh, it's on YouTube. We, we released it in real time. So it's a docu-series. It's 12 episodes. And this amazing uh, documentary filmmaker, Kiwi Callahan, who very gamely agreed to move into an RV with me and my husband for three months, she released a 20-minute episode every single week. So, so as we were on tour, people were following us through this web series, a docu series on YouTube. And so like they would they would be watching us to on our journey across the country to towards them or after we left. It was so amazing. So it's it's all on YouTube. You just have to search for the Joyful Vampire Tour of America. Okay, I'm gonna go watch Vicksburg. I watched a couple as you were starting out. It was just so fun. Like you you really broke the mold. Good job. Thanks. Everybody was talking about you, just so you know. Oh, well. <laughs> um let, let's talk about the book, The Wrong Kind of Woman. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. How did that come about? Um, it came about because 
I did a TED talk, um, as we spoke about last time, about the chronic exclusion of women from film and why that matters to audiences' brains in the rest of the world. And in October of 2017, the week that the Weinstein story broke and the Me Too movement, you know, be- began becoming what it yeah. was. Uh, my TED.com put my talk on their homepage because it was suddenly very topical and uh, it went viral and a million people watched it in three months, um, which oh, was very exciting. No pressure. And, yeah. and when that happens, uh, another thing that happens is that thousands of people email you and message you on social media and all these other things. And in that sort of tsunami of, of contact was a literary agent, uh, Mark Gottlieb, who wrote to me and said, I just saw your talk and I think you have a book in you. And if you want to write it all, I'll, I'll try to sell it for you. And so wonderful. I figured if someone invites you to write a book, you probably should. Yeah. Um, yes. And yes. Uh, so I wrote a book proposal. He sold it um, to the, to a wonderful editor, Rikia Clark at Beacon Press, and I got to write it. Congratulations. It's such a huge feat. Let's talk about the book. Is it... Um, I assume it's more detail and research uh, going off of your TED talk, but I bet there's a lot more to it. Yeah. So, so the title, the full title is "The Wrong Kind of Women Inside Our Revolution to Dismantle the Gods of Hollywood." And I mean, <laughs> so we're not going to play. Um, but so, so basically, I, I had been, ta- I had been somehow gotten on the global speaking circuit talking about this issue about five years before I before this whole thing happened and I got the offer to write the book. And so I'd had so many conversations with people both inside the industry and outside the industry where they would sit, where I heard all of the yeah, buts or the excuses or the, well, it's not really that bad. It's just like a little unfair, but it's, and what I realized was very badly needed was some document and a book was the perfect thing for that that would just lay the whole thing out there so take mm. all of the data that so many great researchers have pulled together about like the on-screen figures of how many women appear on screen and what they say and what they're wearing when they do but also how many women are direct what percentage of them female the directors are women how writers editors you know the 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 measurable impact that that all of that is having on people who consume movies that, that the, that the content that we're consuming now at greater rates than ever is coming almost exclusively from the white male gaze and has for our whole lifetimes. So, so the goal of the book is to lay out all of that data in one place, but then also put the human stories on top of that. So I, I interviewed over a hundred women and men, um, mostly women, obviously up and down the industry, um, just asking them their stories. And, and I, I tried to approach that part of the process very much like a researcher and a journalist. And, you know, I had my own preconceptions, but I just, I would just ask them to tell me the arcs of their careers and sort of the story of, of their journey in the business and tried not to ask any leading questions. Cause I really just wanted to hear like, where did the successes come from? What were the hurdles and, and so on? And what I began to see as I laid all of those interviews out next to each other were the patterns, which were not hard to yeah. spot as you began looking at these careers and realizing that almost every one of these women had had some version of exactly the same story. Um, and so then I took all of that information and those stories and those anecdotes and laid them on top of the data so that what the book does <laughs> is is explain not only the extent to which women have been systematically excluded from the industry almost since its inception. But then also like, how is that happening? <laughs> how is it possible that women are graduating yeah. for, at 50 or 50% of film school graduates and yet 95% of studio films are still directed by men? Like, how is that even possible? What is happening? So I explained that in both data data and human story terms. And then, and then of course, turn to the important work of what, of then, okay, well, what do we do about it? And how do we fix this? Okay. I'm dying to know two things. One, did you figure out what it is that is happening? Yeah. And then two, did you, did you figure out how to fix it? No pressure, yeah. but yeah. yeah, I mean, let's hear it. Okay. So what is happening? So here's what I hoped would come out of those interviews and, and my research. I, what I hoped would happen was that I would come up with like two or three key choke points of, of like moments in women's careers where they were 
getting sort of squeezed out of the industry and I could just go to the powers that be and just say like, if we fix these things, this will be fixed. And what I came yeah. to realize <laughs> is that it is not, w- women are, are being bled out through a thousand cuts. It's, it's, it, it begins the moment they are accepted to film school, but actually begins the moment they begin watching films as a child. But it really begins the moment that they get accepted to film school and receive their list of films you have to watch. You know, almost every film school sends like a hundred films you have to watch before you come to film school. And most of them are uh, by white dudes about white dudes. And so from that moment, women just would describe that summer between getting accepted and going to film school and just like slowly feeling their confidence draining out of them and like that, that they weren't responding to these films in the way that their male, their white male peers were. Mm -hmm. And that like it just either consciously or subconsciously began to tell them immediately that their perspectives weren't valid, that if they could make work, it would never be great work. And sort of like every moment between that and the point that women get squeezed out of the industry by ageism, if they somehow magically haven't been squeezed out before that point, it's sort of like everything. So I actually, um, I think it's chapter five in the book, I go through in detail the whole of women's careers and sort of like look at it, at each beat, what are the things that are happening? And in writing that chapter, and I know that in reading that chapter, it, it can it can bring you to your knees to to look at that because it. I think again, so many of us have told ourselves like, well, yeah, maybe maybe it's a little unfair, or the you know things are kind of stacked against us. But like, if I just work really hard and just am more talented yeah. and and more ambitious and just you know keep my head down and go that that if, that I I can I I can do whatever I you know I can have the career I'm, I'm supposed to have. And I think right, be so good they can't ignore right. you. And while that's true to a certain extent, what I came to really deeply understand is that there is no woman who has ever had the career in the film industry she would have had if she were a man. None. And I include Catherine Bigelow in that. Like, imagine the career Catherine Bigelow would be having if she were a man. She would be directing so many more films, so many bigger films. And so the point I make in the book is, so so then we have to think radically about what, about how to move forward. Because the title of Gloria Steinem's new book is The Truth Will Set You Free, But First It Will Really Piss You Off. (laughs) <laughs> and I feel that right. way about right. the experience people are having of reading my book, which is like, it's, it's painful to know these things. It's painful to, oh, it's enraging. It's, yeah, but it's, it's painful and enraging and, and horrifying to understand the, the extent to which you are being systematically discriminated against. But until you understand that, you can't actually fix it. And, and you can't, that, like, right. then you're, then you're just flying blind. And, and the stories I heard over and over in these interviews and also, from people who have emailed me since reading the book is if you don't understand this, then you end up blaming yourself, right? You end up telling yourself the story of, well, I just must not be good enough. I must not be talented enough. I guess I wasn't working hard enough. I guess I wasn't working hard in the right way. But none of those things are probably true. What is probably the actual story of your career is you were. You were doing all of those things and these massive systemic things have kept you out or kept you from getting to where you should be which is hard, but yeah. And and it feels like we've been, it feels like collectively, at at least I want to say, you know, I've been aware of it and digging in for seriously for about five years. And at the beginning, it feels like, Oh, if we just uncover it, that'll be enough because people are inherently good and value equality. And, and and then you keep uncovering it. And why isn't that enough? Why doesn't that make the difference? Right. And the reason it doesn't make a difference is that what we are basically talking about. So, so, um, white men are about 30% of the U.S. population, just in the general population. Um, oh, there's a percent. Which means that the rest of us are 70% of the population. Um, the white male perspective is currently controlling 95% of all of the films that are being made. Which means that that's a lot which of is power. a lot of power. It is a lot of money. Is it a lot of prestige? A lot of fame? A lot of status? So what we're talking about basically is a situation in which a very small group of people is benefiting from a system that gives them outsized money, power, influence, status, and they don't actually want to give it up. They might say they do, and some of them might really, but like 
this idea that if we just yell at them loudly enough or ask nicely enough or <laughs> write enough things down, right? <laughs> write enough essays that they're somehow going to go like, oh yeah, I guess we'll just give you some of this power. Like there just right. isn't that many cases in, in like all of human history where that has happened, right? Right. Well, and the question is, can, can you can you share the power without giving some up? Um, sort of. I mean, I, I think the, the level of fear that most, or at least a, a large number of white men feel when you begin discussing this stuff, that's a sort of visceral panic that they are going to be erased or eradicated is unfounded, right? We're not, we're not saying that their perspective is invalid. It's not invalid. It's 100% valid 30% of the time. Yeah. But we are saying, you're taking too many jobs and you, and you collectively are taking up too much space. So uh, this is not at all about eradicating white men or making sure that they have no jobs. But reasonably right. speaking, if they have 95% of the jobs currently, yeah, like some of them will lose, will have to lose some of the jobs to to get anywhere close to parity. And that's hard, but it's true. And it's and it's also just unreasonable like the, the current numbers are unreasonable. Yeah. And it's it's funny when you hear, especially the last couple of years, there's been a lot of grumbling of uh, in, in that sense of, oh, I lost a job because I couldn't hire another white guy. The assumption that even the most mediocre white guy is still better than the most infinitely qualified right. woman. Hello, political arena. That that's the assumption right. still. Absolutely. Is a problem. Well, because of unconscious bias, because we were raised in a patriarchy and we were raised in a white supremacist society. And we, you know, like, that's the other thing that I think we, we, the way we think about sexism and racism is that it's a character trait that somebody is sexist or is racist. Um, and mm. that's a, and that's generally considered to be a bad thing. And you don't want to be called that. Well, it's really impolite. Very impolite, <laughs> for sure. To be those, to be those things. Yeah. But, but, but what we're really talking about is that we, we live in a sexist society. We live in a racist yeah. society. All of our structures and institutions were built on a, on a value system that is sexist and is racist. And we were all raised in that society and participate in those systems. So even mm. those of us who are in those populations, our brains were also formed by those, uh, by those isms. And so it's not about like, yeah. is somebody a sexist or a racist? It's about like, on any given day, to what extent are you either upholding those systems that oppress people? Or to what extent are you actively participating in trying to dismantle from them? And, and that's right. and that it's a scale, and it can shift over the course of your lifetime or, or from day to day, like maybe you had a bad day, and you didn't do the right thing. And you you didn't, you know, stand up when you should have stood up. Well, you can do better tomorrow. It's not a fixed point. So where do we go from here? Okay. So chapter 10 in the book, <laughs> the entirety of chapter 10 is a very detailed plan as to how to fix this. And it it addresses every different type of person. So like if you are a film executive, here's what you can do. If you are a female filmmaker, here's what you can do. If you are a film viewer, here's what you can do. If you are a lawyer, here's what you can do. So there's a, there's a very ah. detailed plan in there. But the basic, I love it. the basic idea is that there are two ways this can go. Either the system through some combination of um, public pressure, uh, sh public shaming, <laughs> uh, enough sort of good people getting inside decides to fix itself, right? And if it decides to fix itself, there are some very good examples that suggest they could do that within about two years. This idea that, well, we're, we're trying to fix it, but it's just going to take like 50 years to get there is, is baloney. Uh, if they wanted to fix it, they could fix it in two years. But again, like I was saying before, reasonably speaking, that's not where I'm putting my eggs because I think there just yeah. aren't enough examples of, of people in power, like willingly turning over that power. So, but the other thing is, is there's still that 70% of us that are not benefiting from the system, both those of us who are in the industry trying to have careers, but also the 70% of audiences who are not being serviced by the content that is being made and would really, really like to have the resonance of seeing themselves in the stuff they watch. Um, 
Yeah. So, which is why this is why the title, uh, the word revolution is in the title of my book is I think the more viable plan is basically full blown insurrection and to understand that, <laughs> um, their system is a made up system and they don't actually have the power to choose us or not choose us anymore because now we have the internet and we, we can make content and distribute it to audiences without ever needing a gatekeeper to choose us. Um, and now more than ever, that's a viable possibility. And I, I think actually COVID has made that even more viable because we're in this moment. Yeah. Cause up until two, up until, you know, March of this year, uh, we were, we were rapidly moving towards a situation in which basically three companies owned the entirety of the content universe in Hollywood. Yeah. And yeah. they still do at this moment, but also they are in deep, deep trouble now. Like their, their, their system is crumbling beneath their feet as a result of what's happening. And so this is our moment, I think, because everything about how we live and do th and consume things is going to have to be reinvented. And we need to be on the bleeding edge of figuring out what that is. Because then we can, we can rebuild a system that is inclusive at a, at a cellular level rather than trying to impose that upon a system that was not. Yeah. Just, just for clarity, today is April 27th, just to give this context, because I'm not sure when this will come out, but we are in the middle of COVID where it seems like everything we thought we knew is no longer true. Every system we thought we had isn't like, if I've learned one thing during this time is that nobody knows yep. anything. Um, yep. and to think that we do have the opportunity to come out the other side of this with everything changed. And if we do it right, it could be changed in a better way. And I was, I was also thinking about this today of in this time of, because there is an element of panic and scarcity and unemployment and desperation. And, and that has the potential of shutting down all this, you know, diversity yeah. talk, whatever. We don't have time for that. Right. Now we have to save the industry. Right. I think that's a danger. Well, I think that will definitely happen within the industry. There, I have no doubt that they'll, they will use this as, a, as an excuse to be like, great. And now <laughs> exactly what you said. Now, like this, this diversity talk has been fun, but now we need to get back to business. And <laughs> right. we, we don't talk about that right now. Um, but, but what I'm saying is they don't, it's going to take them longer to figure out what to do about this because they're not nimble. I mean, they are going to be the last ones to get back into production because there are so many people. Like they don't know how to make films with 10 people on set. We do. Um, right. Right. and so in this vacuum of this moment, we actually have in certain ways the upper hand because we have, we have the nimbleness to be able to figure this out quickly. So the indie filmmakers can actually make the content that everyone is going to be so exactly. desperate for. Going to have to demand the money too, right? Um, but this, but but this is another uh, thing about this moment that I'm noticing, which is that, like in in certain places, there is a culture of scarcity that's emerging, right? Toilet paper being being right. top of that list, right? For, for example. example, but there but there are a lot of other places where I notice people's relationship with money shifting. Like I've mm -hmm. been noticing some some wealthier people watching for instance me or other artists who you know are vulnerable under normal circumstances and now are like in a very dicey position and i and i see them going like understanding for the first time how sort of random it is that they work hard at their job and make so much money and i work really hard at my job and make no money <laughs> and that yeah. like i can see people kind of understanding in a different way that they have to put money towards the things that they value if they want to keep them. Um, so I actually think, I actually think maybe not right now because we're still kind of in the middle of the building shaking, but, but I feel like arts funding may actually do better out of this. Uh, let's hope. I mean, it has revealed everything, yeah. you know, how on the edge of disaster most people yeah. are how tenuous everything is and also what what do you find important now to spend your money on right exactly and like what right that's what i'm saying and understanding like oh if i want that restaurant to still be there i need to order takeout right. from that restaurant or i mean i right. don't have much money but i'm i like there's this dance studio that i love here in atlanta where i live now and like you know i'm buying t-shirts from them and just like anything cuz i need that place to still exist when i'm 
back and I wouldn't have done that two months ago. Right, right. Yeah, it is. It is so interesting. I also want to ask you, did your book tour get cut short? It did a little bit, but not by much. It, so th- I got through the first two weeks of it. And I, it was really only the last three events that were impacted, which I feel incredibly lucky about. Yeah. So I, I had a, a wonderful and sold out book tour. And it was amazing to watch the the sort of the worm turn on this whole thing, too, because I had a an event the Sunday night. It was like March 13th or something, I want to say. And that in LA, and that oh, event yeah. was sold out and full and packed. And then I I didn't have anything that Monday. And then I had an event Tuesday night. And by Tuesday, only two people showed up to the event. And I was like, Oh, yeah, that was the weekend we shut down. Like it got real for yeah. LA. That no, week. it was like it was between the Sunday and the Tuesday. It, it, everything was different. It was, it was over. over. It was yeah. like, okay. Yeah. All right. And so then I moved my uh, last two events online, which was fine. Tell us about your next film. Um, so I'm I'm on draft about 13 of my third feature film, which is tentatively titled Hammond Castle and is about a seven month pregnant woman who gets locked overnight in a castle full of famous ghosts. Um, <laughs> we had been planning on shooting it in 2021. Although, of course, like everything that is a quite big old question mark right now. but. Yeah. We are thinking, uh, we are looking very seriously into turning it actually during quarantine into a radio play and releasing it as a serial radio play first, um, as a way oh, of building audience and sort of building up an underlying IP for the film so that hopefully mm-hmm. that can get it made faster afterwards. Smart, smart. That's great. How can people reach you? Naomi McDougalljones.com. Or if that's too hard to remember, it's NaomiMJ.com. We'll get you to the same place. And uh, yeah, everything's on there. Where to see my films, my classes, how to contact me. The Joyful Vampire Tour of America series is up there. All sorts of things. Well, thank you so much. You are such a beacon of light in this movement and at this time and all the things. Thank you for doing all the really hard work. Thank you. And thank you so much for having me back and for everything you do to to help change this. Oh, it's, we, we all have to do yeah. our part. It's been so good yes, talking you to you. Well. All right. Thanks. We will okay, talk thank soon. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. You've been listening to The Other 50%, a history of Hollywood. I'm Julie Harris-Walker. I'd like to thank Naomi McDougall-Jones for sharing her story. Now is a great time to go to her website and sign up for her virtual classes in filmmaking. And special thanks to Jay Rowey, Danny Rosner, and Allison McQuaid for the music. Please find us on your favorite podcast provider and leave a review. And of course, on our website, theother50percent.com, all spelled out for added features, bios of our guests, and the merch. You can also follow us on all the social media platforms. Thanks for listening. See you next time.